Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, yesterday was already exciting. I said, oh my God, I should have got this invitation 20 years before because there is an <laughs> incredible research potential. Um, on the other hand, when I was invited by uh, Gabor Thomas to take part in this network, I was a bit hesitant because we have some problems with royal residences in Northern Go. And I wondered how I could possibly contribute to a debate on them when you have no archaeological research on them in Merovingian times. But I thought it might be an interesting topic in itself if it was reformulated. What does it mean that we have no Merovingian royal residences or even aristocratic residences in the archaeological records? Is this just a lack of proper research or is residential display not an element of elite culture in Merovingian times? Another possible answer is that in a large part of Northern Gaul there's hardly an elite important enough to build aristocratic residences. Kings, however, were present and so there must have been royal residences too. The problem with my presentation is thus that I cannot really answer the questions in the synopsis for the Merovingian period and only to a limited extent for the Carolingian period. And so I apologize for my detour into the black hole of uh, archaeology of royal residences of Northern Gaul. On the other hand, that's what I was referring to, I made, it made me realize once more what a formidable void there is in the continental early medieval archaeology. And another thing is that on the basis of what we discussed yesterday, I would rephrase a number of things. Though. So um, let's see what happens in the discussion. So we are all familiar with the splendid palatium built by uh, Charlemagne and Louis the Pious in uh, Aachen. Parts of it are still standing upright in the church of uh, St. Uh, Mary uh, because it was used in later times as a church in which the German emperors were crowned. Its plan is supposed to be inspired by San Vitale in Ravenna, which was visited several times by Charlemagne, or a church in Constantinople. There's a debate on that. The town hall in Aachen uh, retains in its core the former Aula Regia. After years of silence, new research on the palace and its environment was taken up again. Sebastian uh, Ristov came up with this plan. Um, he, he looked at all the plans of former research and presented first results of a new chronology and there's some amazing things in this image that is uh, oh, it's not the red, the red. Yeah. so there's this building which is supposed to be older than the uh, Charlemagne's uh, palace so probably a thing built already by Pippin the first and then there's this building, which is not part of the original plan of the Carolingian palace, but maybe later uh, in the uh, ninth uh, century. And uh, so if you look in more detail at the plan, there's this okay, where is it? This green and r and yellow hatch thing, suggesting that it is not part of the original plan. So if you look at the chronology, is um, so. Um, we are eagerly awaiting the more detailed argumentations uh, behind uh, this chronology. It was discussed yesterday also uh, extensively. Uh, interesting observations are the <coughs> early date of one of the annexes uh, to the chapel and the later date of the hall between the chapel and the Aula Regia. Moreover, new excavations by Andreas uh, Schau. Uh, provides new insights into the nature of the settlement surrounding the palace, although this is town archaeology and thus the size of the excavated plots is relatively small. The same upswing of archaeological research took place in Ingelheim, where the remains of the apse of the Aula Regia uh, can still be seen. It's reconstructed like this. Because of this new research by Holger Grewe, uh, the ideas on the development of the Ingelheim Palatium are changing too, although in my view Ingelheim still has its chapel problem um, in that this palace does not seem to have a proper chapel in the palace complex itself. Next there is, I come back to that, next there is old and new research on the Paderborn uh, Palatium. The old excavations directed by Wilhelm Winkelmann took place from 1964 to 1971 and 74 to 77. 
the documentation and finds he was sitting on the side all the time and there was no development in thinking. But everyone retires. Uh, the documentation and finds were studied <laughs> anew, which led to a series of reconstructions of the successes faces by Sveva uh, Guy. Um, this is the palace from about uh, 776, date with a uh, aula and a church and a, and a big uh, cemetery and then we get this type of reconstructions also a kind of alignment shown uh, in one of the images of the previous presentation and the palace um, later on with big uh, new church and a uh, bigger aula and then there's another aula where you can get in uh, at present which is uh, of a younger date uh, and finally, there is the research on the Frankfurt Palace among the ruins of the... Uh, oh, there's the reconstruction of the uh, palace in the 9th century with the church. Finally, is the research on the Frankfurt Palace among the ruins of the Second World War. The excavation documentation was restudied by Magnus Wintergest, who suggested the reconstruction of the successive phases of the site. Uh, here we are in the middle of the 9th uh, century, and I'll come back to that place uh, too. This is the image that we saw just before. These four palaces are actually the four best analyzed Carolingian palaces. One wonders to what extent they provide a good impression of the development of Carolingian palaces. After all, they all belong to the series of new palaces built by Charlemagne and Louis the Pious since the later 8th century. This is related to the movement to the north of the center of gravity of the Frankish kingdom, with, with which I will deal later also. These palaces have no Merovingian predecessors. There are no Merovingian royal palaces before on the site, although older activities are observed on all sides. The Aachen Palace is built on the site of a splendid Roman spa with hot water springs. The Roman Vicus was characterized by unusual splendid architecture Mediterranean style, not, not Gaulish style, so to say. Part of the Roman infrastructure might have been intact when Charlemagne decided to build a palace there, which became in the second half of his reign the preferred residence, although it must have been a building site during much of his life, as Rosamund McKittrick <coughs> justly stressed. Paderborn too was built at the site of a spring, Post holes that predate the building of the palace in the later 8th century indicate that uh, some earlier building activities had taken place there, but it might as well be a rural site. Its nature is not easy to establish. At Frankfurt, uh, there were installations. This is yeah. The, at Frankfurt, there were installations from the Merovingian period a small chapel and burials that might have belonged to an estate. Let me see what happens. There is the chapel and there is a heated room somewhere to the north and in this heated room that was already more or less a bit ruinous there is the grave of a very um, of, of a girl which, uh, with lavish grave goods. So lavish there is there's also as a grave good there is the cremation remains of another child in her grave. It's a very strange uh, thing happening there. Um, a small chapel and burials that might have belonged to an estate. The Carolingian palace is a creation not by Charlemagne but by Louis the Pious. It is thus a somewhat later phenomenon than the palaces at Aachen, Ingelheim and Paderborn, although we know that Charlemagne organized a synod there in 794. So in what kind of infrastructure was he <coughs> having this quite important synod? So this synod took place at a site that could not be designated at that time as a royal palace, maybe. It was a royal site or the estate he acquired, whatever, I have no idea. It is suggested that it was an aristocratic residence of the 7th century. A small chapel and a heated room were discovered of this site of which the heated room was abandoned, and in, in it the grave of a girl with rich grave goods was dug in and around this grave in the ruins of the heated room a cemetery developed. You see the blue graves on the, on the plan. So settlement must have been present in view of the sunken huts found. It's not exactly clear what type of site it was where Charlemagne held his synod, because the palace proper was created later. <coughs> 
and Charles the Born, Charles the Bold was born here in 823 in Palazzo Novo. So it can't be very old at that time. Ingelheim too seems to have been built on or near an estate. Recent excavations have shown that the church dedicated to Remigius, about 450 meters to the west of the palace, already dates to the 7th century. The excavators relate this church to the estate present um, at that time. And the structure of the estate is, however, unknown. At the site of the 10th century church, inside the palace, this church, they excavated the church, there is not a Carolingian church on the site. At the site of the 10th century church in the Palatium complex, traces of habitation dated to the 5th and 6th century were found, but no Carolingian habitation or predecessor of the church. It is possible that the palace was built on a fairly virgin part of the estate at that time. There's a big problem with the chapel of this, uh, um, so th they had no church until recently and now they have this tree conch, uh, very small, it's, it's smaller than this room, as the palace chapel. I don't, it's, it's part of the bathhouse, but I dare to say it here, I don't dare to say it. In, and another thing I dare to say here is that the Exedra, this half round building, is reconstructed as a corridor and buildings and towers outside. It's a theatre. But they never reconstructed it as a theatre. Uh, if I say this in Germany, I'm not allowed to enter there anymore, I guess. Uh, I, have no, I have no evidence to, to, to say that. I have to study in detail the, the, the report. So, it, so the excavations show that there is quite some variability in the topographical development of individual palaces. Although they are more or less part of the same building programme, possibly. Moreover, the starting situations differ considerably. There might be Roman antecedents of which the nature at the time of the creation of the palace is not yet fully clear in the case of Aachen. The presence of a spring was certainly important in the cases of Aachen and Paderborn. Ingelheim and Frankfurt were probably created next to older estates. They had no direct uh, Roman antecedents. In Frankfurt, the Roman habitation was located further up on dry land to the north. Another palace, mentioned in 777, the one at Nijmegen, to do something about the Netherlands as well, uh, was located in the remains of a late Roman fortress on top of a ridge overlooking the lowland river area to the north. You see the palace next to the town. This is the palace uh, created by uh, Frederick Barbarossa. There were three palaces. One Carolingian, destroyed by the Vikings, a new one, Ottonian, and then a one uh, refurbished and rebuilt by uh, Frederick Barbarossa and they tear the whole thing, thing down uh, late in the 8th and 18th century. Some of the remains of the Roman fort must have been visible or reused. The palace was demolished in 700, 1798. Not much remained of the Carolingian palace by that time because it was replaced by one commissioned by Frederick Barbarossa in the mid 12th century. All the archaeological evidence collected since the early 20th century on this palace is now being restudied by one of my PhD students. The new results will mainly deal with the habitation around the palace itself, around this big stone uh, heap, because the fragments of information are not very informative on the structure of the palace itself. It's a no-go area for archaeologists, but probably in the coming years someone with a lot of money is allowed to build a hotel, so we were... Yeah, that's money, what, what, what money does, but we, we will be able to excavate some. The extant remains on the site are an 11th century chapel, this one, uh, with an Aachen model, and a 12th century apse related to the palace built by Frederick Barbarossa, but there might be some Carolingian uh, wall remains inside it. As said, the palaces mentioned so far belong to a new series of palaces created by Charlemagne and Louis the Pious. If one looks at the itinerary of those two... Yeah, here it is, the ancient map by Brühl. Uh, 
If one looks at the itinerary of those things, this should be done entirely anew. Rosemont McKittrick in her book on Charlemagne is already commenting on moving kings or moving courts. We should distinguish between places where charters were issued, where they stayed longer, where they were. This should be a map with showing the activities at the, all these places. So th that would be very interesting to do this anew, I think. If one looks at the itinerary of those uh, two kings, one can see that they mainly remained in the northern part of the kingdom, as is shown on this map by Carl Richard Brühl. When they moved out of this region, it was into Aquitaine, into the southwest, and into Italy. One can also see that the visits in the north were not confined to the Rhine Meuse valleys alone. They also visited the palaces in northern France. If we zoom in, uh, so I, I redid some of the maps. If we zoom in, we can have a better view on the frequency of visits. The, the figures next to the uh, red dots are the number of visits by Charlemagne in those places, uh, not the other kings. Uh. It is clear that Charlemagne visited the palaces along the Meuse and Rhine rivers most often, especially Herstal in the beginning, Aachen and Worms. However, Charlemagne can be found several times in the palaces of Quiasi and Attigny in uh, northern France. There were other minor palaces that were visited by Carolingians once in a while, and there must be a whole host of royal uh, villas, of royal estates that they never visited. Archaeological research of these palaces is however very meager, as is clear from the research, recent research by Annie Renou and Georgiane uh, Barbier. Our image is mainly determined, I have no slides of that, uh, by excavations from the first half of the 20th century by German scholars during the First World War in the palaces of Quiasi and Samoussi. However, as both French scholars acknowledge, both excavations are not easy to interpret and leave us with many uncertainties. The archaeological research of Carolingian palaces in northern France is still in its infancy compared to the German research. Or in other words, there are great opportunities to be grabbed uh, there. The map of Carolingian palaces is interesting in another respect. The early Carolingians, when they were still mayors of the palace, and the early kings used the palaces in the Aene, was the Marne region more often than Charlemagne and Louis the Pious. Charles Martel, Pepin and Carloman, Charlemagne's brother, can be found more in northern France than along the Rhine and the Meuse rivers. Charlemagne's building campaign thus clearly marks a changeover to the northeast of the kingdom. He himself preferred the palace at Herstal and the one at Worms, and then in his later years he mainly used Aachen. The early Carolingians thus continued a Merovingian tradition. The royal residences of the Merovingian kings in northern Gaul are found in that very region where Charles Martel and his descendants stayed. The big problem is, however, that we have no archaeological knowledge whatsoever on these Merovingian residences. What then do we know of these residences on the basis of the written sources? And that knowledge is limited too. We do know a series of places where kings stayed, from mainly from the text of Gregory of Tours in the 6th century. But the sources provide hardly any information on the infrastructure needed to house the king or the royal court. For the 6th century, our major source is the, are the writings of Gregory, Bishop of Tours. Margarete Weidemann mined these texts in search of various aspects of Merovingian society in her Kulturgeschichte der Merovingerzeit nach den Werken Gregors von Tours. Very helpful. <laughs> Moreover, the work by Karl Richard Brühl, which is still uh, a must if you will do anything on this, from 1968, uh, on the provision of the court, is still basic reading. From their works, the following observations are important for our team. Gregory of Tours uses several words to indicate royal residences, such as sedes regni, cathedra regni, palatium, aula regia, and domus regalis. The term sedes has been hotly debated, but its interpretation as a capital of a tile reich is probably too modern. Merovingian kings, like uh, their Carolingian successors were regularly on the move, 
and the court and the thesaurus went with him, is what Karl Richard Brühl uh, and others say. But there is a debate on whether the king is moving and the court is moving, uh, so that there might be two different things. Uh, as can be seen, all the terms refer to residences in towns. We have no idea how a Merovingian urban royal residence looks like. Brühl is categorical in his opinion that the Merovingian kings used the late Roman praetorie of provincial governors or other state-owned complexes used by lower-ranking Roman officials, officials such as uh, the one in Cologne. This is Oh my God! And, uh, oh. This is a map of Cologne with a Roman uh, town wall, and here is the Praetorium, and it says Aula Regia, and everyone believes this is the Aula Regia, but we have a building from the Roman period, and we have in Gregory of Tours one line that the people are fighting in Cologne, and that some of them uh, rush into a Aula Regia. So this is clearly the Aula Regia um, of Gregory of Tours. There is a small problem, be um, well, every one of us has seen images of Cologne uh, after the Second World War, you could excavate the entire town, but there was not enough time, so the excavations went quite quick by Otto Doppelfeld and others, and so they collected many boxes of pottery and they excavated the Praetorium, you can still visit it under the town hall, but when you open the boxes there is not a single Merovingian church in the boxes. So there is no evidence of a medieval use of this. Uh, it could be a, s a selection, it could be related to the excavation techniques and the Merovingian church are most probably in the upper layers, may, might be destroyed, etc., etc. But there is a problem in this, in the thesis that uh, Merovingian kings reuse the Praetorie and uh, Brühl dismisses Alexander Bergengrün's suggestion that Merovingian kings might have created palaces of their own. However, on what grounds is not clear to me. In his time, and still today, there is no archaeological research of any importance to substantiate one of those claims, use of the ancient Roman structure or re-creation of new palaces. Merovingian kings, however, did not exclusively uh, reside in towns. Gregory of Tours recounted how he was once summoned to the villa of Nogent sur Marne near Paris. He was accused of something, he had to show up. Uh, other important royal residences were in Compiègne and Berny Rivière. So Merovingian kings used rural residences too. To what extent these rural residences continued Roman traditions cannot be said without any archaeological research. Brühl says that the big difference between the Merovingian kings and the Carolingian kings, not in my text, but the Carolingian kings, is that Merovingian kings were resident kings, they stayed in the towns, and the Carolingian kings were these itinerant guys running around all the time, and that they used fixed places, these sedes regia, these capitals of the Tile uh, But that's it's clear evidence that they have, uh, are using uh, constantly also rural um, villae. Uh, um, kings also resided incidentally in towns not um, indicated as sedes or having a palatium. Some of these visits lasted relatively long, for months for instance, indicating that a royal residence or a building complex suited to receive the court or the king and his entourage must have existed. Brühl, however, interestingly observed, I would say contrary to the observations he made a few pages before, Brühl, however, interestingly observed that the majority of the 100 Merovingian charters, royal charters, we have is given in rural palatiae, not in towns. So this nuances, I think, the idea that Merovingian kings preferred towns as residences. If we map the places uh, where Gregory of Tours, so that's mainly second half of the 6th century, this is also the 7th century of course, mentions visits of some importance by Merovingian kings in the northern part of the kingdom, we get the following map. The big polygons are the Sedes Regiae. There is of course Paris, Soissons and Reims, and later uh, Reims is replaced uh, by Metz, and there's another one further south in Orléans, but it's outside my map. <coughs> 
the open polygons are towns visited by the king during longer periods like Cologne so maybe he was in the Praetorium after all we don't know maybe he was in another place the smaller polygons are rural palaces and the small dots are places mentioned in relation to kings on an occasional basis in Tournai Cologne and in Cambre, Merovingian kings are mentioned by Gregory, which must have had a rather regional power base and who were annihilated by Clovis in his bid for power. There was a, a small petty king and they, all their heads were chopped off by Clovis uh, and he was crying and complaining that all his relatives had died. Uh, how come? Uh, <laughs> For Cambrai and Tournai, this seems to be the end of the story. Uh, and the star refers to a rural palace frequented in the 7th century, but not in the 6th. And there must have been uh, more of these, that, like in Maastricht, there are Merovingian kings uh, issuing charters, so everyone expects that the king is there in Maastricht, but you can question that. Uh. So this, this should be really done anew as well, and, and try to get out of the Merovingian sources all the places where kings are related to in one way or another, and see what kind of map that... Uh. We can easily observe the relatively dense distribution of royal palaces in the Aene, Oise, Marne region, although the number of rural ones is not very big, and they seem to be related to the Sedes of Paris and Soissons, they are quite close to these Sedes Regiae. If we take Tournai and Cambrai uh, off the map, there's no kings anymore after Clovis, and the 7th century star on the coast as well, and realize that Metz is becoming important later in the 6th century to the detriment of Reims, one can observe that the 6th century network of royal residences in Northern Gaul is not very dense. There are of course more places that were incidentally visited by the kings in the 7th century, like Maastricht, but it's impossible to tell what kind of infrastructure they used. There were intensive excavations in Maastricht. We have no idea uh, what the place looked like uh, where he stayed. Here we arrive at one of the great enigmas of Merovingian archaeology of Northern Gaul, one that was observed by others too. It is the near invisibility of residences of the elite, both of the king and the aristocrats. And this may have two reasons. The first reason is uh, related to research history. There was in the past no problem-oriented research directed at understanding royal residences. Not in France, where the majority of the Merovingian residences was present, neither in Germany. This might be related to the popularity of unquestioned models, such as the continued use of Roman administrative infrastructure by Merovingian kings. Why search for a Merovingian palace if you have the Praetorium? Uh, this hampers the search for residences constructed by the Merovingians. Why is it impossible to think that they created such palaces when their Gothic and Lombard counterparts created such palaces in Spain and Italy? What we need is a change of perspective and keep all possibilities open. On the other hand, one wonders why we have no more remains of such palaces in towns. If the Merovingians used urban palaces intensively, be it Roman structures or newly created ones, why don't we see them? Because one might expect that such prestigious places were kept in use later on, which would increase their visibility or at least kept the reminiscences alive of their presence, so it would not be too difficult to identify their location. Go to Reims and ask the archaeologists where is the Merovingian palace? They have no idea. Today they have in several times no clue as to the whereabouts of the Merovingian palaces. There are no clear archaeological indications either. If we put this along another observation, the problem is highlighted even more. Is the absence of elite residences in the archaeological record of Northern Gaul. Chris Lovelock spent a chapter on expressions of leadership and models for emulation AD 500-900 in his Northwest Europe in the early Middle Ages. But in contrast to the surrounding regions, England, Scandinavia, Southern Gaul, Spain, Italy, no proper elite residential sites can be presented for the Merovingian period. He turns quickly over to monasteries. Uh, <laughs> of course, there is something going on in uh, Saint-Denis uh, monastery where there is a, a palace identified as a palace. I couldn't tell by the building. Eh? One wonders whether they did not use this 
One wonders whether they did not use this play in the built environment to represent and enhance their position. It could be related to the incapacity to create lasting positions of power for elite families. Take the powerful Pippinids. It took them almost a century from Pippin I to Charles Martel to create a lasting power position. In that process, they needed the support of powerful women, such as Plectrude, the wife of Pippin II. I would like to go one step further than Chris Lovelock and others like Chris Wickham, who do not question the presence of powerful elite groups or even an aristocracy. They point to the rich, privileged greys in Northern Gaul, especially those in Saint-Denis, Hildrick's grave and the greys in the Cologne Cathedral, but there's not too many of them. Next to these are privileged greys that I think are strongly overrated in aristocratic terms and consequently as proof for the omnipresence of elite controlling land and people, of an elite controlling land and people. Many of them do not represent more than local or regional power and might often be owners of large farms. Every year single, similar greys are unearthed, making them ever more common and in a hundred years there are these greys everywhere. We should really ask to what extent there was an aristocratic stratum, a higher aristocratic stratum, of importance in Northern Gaul in the 6th and 7th centuries, and to what extent the elite that we can see developing in the 7th century already controlled a diverse rural population to such an extent as the elite did in Carolingian times. My suggestion would be that the answer to this question is rather negative. Northern Gaul is dominated by a rural population that remains out of strong aristocratic control during a large part of the Merovingian period. And remember, if you map the monasteries on this map, you won't find much before the middle of the 7th century. So there is neither an, an, an extraction of surplus by monasteries because it's only developing later in the 7th and in the, especially the 8th century. Um, it changes when in the course of the 8th century an extractive economy develops sustaining the Carolingians and making it possible to build new palaces like the ones in Aachen and Ingelheim. With this discussion we touch upon an old debate on the nature of Merovingian aristocracy among German historians characterized by legal institutional perspective and mainly based on written sources from outside the region such as the writings of Gregory of Tours. Some scholars advocated the position that the Merovingian aristocracy, which is to be distinguished from the senatorial nobility, only developed later in the 6th century because of the privileges obtained in relation to service to the king. These scholars are castigated by those who believe there should always be an aristocracy in complex societies and who generalize for the whole of Gaul on the basis of regionally restricted written sources and pottery distribution patterns. If you have real turn pottery in this area, there must be an aristocracy. It's Chris Wickham's argumentation. Sorry. This is, is this recorded also? Oh my god. <laughs> He's sending him the video, don't <laughs> <laughs> I would say that those historians have the archaeologists on their side as long as they do not come up with proper elite and royal residences. There must be royal residences, no doubt about that. Is Northern Gold that special in its absence of elite residences or is it simply a matter of insufficient research? In view of the intensive settlement research in the Paris Basin as presented by Edith Petreman mentioned yesterday or that in the Netherlands uh, and the absence of such elite sites in the archaeological record, I suggest that this, in this case the, uh, the absence of evidence might start to become evidence of their absence. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Franz. Uh, we're just going to break for coffee soon, but uh, maybe time for a quick couple of questions. Uh, I don't feel quite so bad about our lack of evidence in Northern Britain anymore, so that's uh, one, one positive thing. Uh, but uh, fantastic presentation again, showing the complexity of, of royal sites and royal landscapes once again in, in Northern Gaul. Any quick questions or comments? Really, a sort of ob observation, but I do think that those sites of double monasteries of the Limminge type might be worth looking at as residences. I mean, that's mm -hmm. where Anglo Saxons got their idea from, mm -hmm. and I could mention Farmoutier, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the uh, Columban ones, a relatively early foundation. It's made quite 
it, well, it seems to be implied by the um, life of, of, of Columbanus that uh, this was the residence of the Pharaonids, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the, 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 where they yep. established the, the double monastery, which yes. then could be its history fluctuates because the Pharaonids themselves yeah. lose power yeah. and then it um, eventually yeah. probably continued as a, 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 a monastery but yeah. or church but not yeah. so closely linked with the Pharaonids because yeah. they've yeah. built a new yeah. and then you could look at if you are for uh, the, yeah. another another branch of the house and you have somewhere like Shell. Yeah, that's also a royal residence. Yeah, so. yeah, which you know where Chilperic um, was, died I think he died at Shell. Yeah. There's so many Merovingian kings that yeah, don't yeah, know I don't know by heart. I think he, I think he, had, he yeah. had died there and then Bolthild mm. yeah. found it as a, a double monastery and that yeah. is very much as a model for the Anglo-Saxon ones. So yeah. I do wonder if, like, as is possible with Limage, that they could be dual... I left it out, but the uh, relation, because there are more mentions of kings staying at monasteries and there's a developing debate on the relation between uh, a monastic community and the king, and when the king or uh, an aristocrat is staying at the monastery, is he living on the uh, monastery's resources, or is there next to the monastery resources also resources for those aristocrats? And so, I think again, I, I think early medieval history uh, historians should take up this theme of itinerant kingship, uh, type of residences, the relation between monastic sites and and residences and it, I think we should with these new archaeological things from England from other entirely restart the debate actually I mean, it's just, my feeling but just uh, following on from that I think isn't that the site of Hamage it suggested yeah. that there's a there's a pre monastic phase that potentially you could argue was a, an aristocratic yeah. residence in, in a sense there is not there is no problem with the idea that an estate is changed over into a monastery like Echternach. It's also built on... There, are, there must have been many estates that were turned... Uh, were, 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 where, I should not say turned over into them, where a monastery was created. So then that... And, 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 and then you hear, as you referred also, you, the, the documented phase is the monastery yeah, phase. So everyone says, as from now on, it's a monastery. Yeah. But what remains of the, of, the, of the previous structures and so there is... Look at Echternach, you have this huge Roman villa, which is certainly abandoned in the early 5th uh, century. Then you get the site of the monastery, but there's also this, this round um, defensive structure next to the monastery, which is also kept in use. There's an interesting church on top of it. And, what is the relation between this thing yeah. and, and the monastery uh, next to it? So we, we should re rethink the whole concept of monastery in this... this oh, I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I... I just wanted to um, um, come, come back to you, Franks. I, I agree absolutely what you're saying, if you like, about the levels and scale of elite identity, the mm -hmm. number of supposedly important graves which mm -hmm. they're now, now, now are known from Northern France, Northern France and Germany. And I think the, the thing that just strikes me is the scale, <coughs> the territorial scale that we're, ta we're talking about. So there's your Merovingian kingship circuit. As, as you say, many, many, many within this area, many, 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 many regional elites. But of course the sort of political organisation political uh, group we're talking about in England at the same time is that size, that size, yeah. that size. Um, and I, 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 th I think you're right, there is, there is a, a much, there is a hierarchy, but it is much more local, much more local and, and much flatter, if you like, under the authority, I propose, of the, of the Merovingian kings. And that second tier mm -hmm. of elites, regional elites, mm -hmm. is actually really what we're picking up. Mm -hmm. Um, in the archaeology of England where we see these, uh, these elite centres, yeah. they aren't precisely comparable. The yeah. scale, the yeah, degree yeah, of power yeah. and the scale, geographical scale of power is quite different. We were discussing exactly the same thing. If you talk about itinerant kingship, it makes a difference if you travel around in the Carolingian Empire between Rome and... Uh, or if you have the much smaller English kingdoms. And yeah. what does it mean, the scale of itinerancy in, in smaller kingdoms, what yeah. does a royal side then mean? They, in principle, simply technically seen, they must return to these places more yeah. often than. Yeah. So, 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 scale and itinerancy should really, and that's why this new research into the evidence for itinerant kingship and the, this, the location of the charts, it should be done anew with this perspective. But I do think your, your observation about the 
the so-called elite grades mm -hmm. is really, really important in that, in that mm -hmm. context. We're doing that now with research masters because they, they all put them in one big heap, all the rich grades. But there is a, a, there's a number of reasons why these are present and talk with Helena. These early, the early rich greys in these cult sites, they are all women and children. There's a specific reason why these greys are there and why they were women and why they were children in the definition of the relations with the supernatural. So it's not a straightforward indication, of course, which greys must be of people. But this, if you look at the modern discussion on personhood and you take fractal personhood, a community might uh, represent an important person as representing the entire community and all oh, and is uh, incredibly invested in this grave not necessarily this person being that rich and mm. there's alternative interpretations for these graves possible so, so could, could I just ask about these Merovingian chances that you say the rural places what what exactly is the language they use to describe these places do they I don't like know I'm not necessarily <laughs> 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 I, I, mean, I surrender I, I mean the, the English charters tend I mean Palatium will be very unusual but I mean Villa is often used but often simply in this date and especially because what's interesting uh, and I, it always struck me that English charters up to I mean when you get the sort of thing Barbara was talking about in the ninth century uh, that sort of Somerton and so forth then you're starting to get and in, 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 in Mercia from Tamworth from the 790s you're starting to get regular attestations in the same place before that it's all over the place and a very high proportion of the places uh, where charters are issued are small or, or in many cases unidentifiable Mm -hmm. I mean, if just have in mind a charter of offer of 779, which survives as an original, which just says, Apud Yortla Ford. Well, where's that? It might be Hartleford outside Worcester, it might not. But, but and, and there's an awful lot of that, which makes me think that a lot of these attestations by kings are happening in places which is just where they happen to, to stop on that occasion. They're Could not be. necessarily in a hurry. They're maybe they're hunting, they're ambling through the countryside, <laughs> the evening falls, and they just stop, and that's where, that's where it's... Yeah, maybe depending yeah, also for whom it is. <laughs> if it's a, a local monastery, you might... But yeah, you should make a distinction, I think, between charters for institutions far away and, in, and charters for institutions nearby. With they, for nearby, they might be everywhere, but, but if, you are, is, is, if you are donating something to Saint-Denis, uh, maybe, is, is, would you do that in the middle of a forest or would you do that in a... <laughs> so, so you have to... Mm. Uh, I think you should... You historians should look new at this, this yes. type of evidence. But I suppose that, that, I mean, that might be right, but on the other hand, I mean, might it just be that this is business the king does on a certain occasion, yeah, you know, yeah, before yeah. dinner, like Alfred washing his hands, and, and you know, the, 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 the king goes, okay, so we have, we have this business to do, I've got to ascend to these charters, and maybe, you know, that somebody organises the business and he does it, and, and, and after all, Sandy and he want to get their charter sooner rather than later. Maybe yeah, they're quite on happy. special days like St. Stephen's, or what I call tournaments of value in towns. We've got to approach the question diplomatically. I mean, yes, are the particular yes, sorts yeah, yeah, of documents sure, sure. where you specify the place where the, the, the business yeah, is yeah. being done? Yeah, sure. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just actually editing a paper by Andrew Miller on Episcopal charters of the of the 13th century, where, oh, sorry, by Michael Berger, where there is absolute specific reference to what room within the palace the <laughs> charter It's just a diplomatic phase in the way that these yeah. charters have developed. I mean, and there may be some periods where the um, church that's receiving the charter might have wanted to suggest a more important place was used, mm. where, where the king happened to be near there, or where, where a stage mm. in the confirmation took place, and at other times... Or, uh, or it just flows in, in yeah, diplomatic, yeah, describable it, diplomatic yeah. practice, yeah, you know, as yeah, to what, what, right. what you do. Well, but I mean, until we could see the pattern of that mm. in the surviving documentation, I quite take your we, point. We do need this, both but, English and Ameri yeah, yeah, American. Yeah. 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 Yep, I think we'll stop there. <laughs> 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 <laughs>